talk. To communicate or exchange ideas or information by speaking. What are you saying with your words? What you love. What you're afraid of. You tell people what your priorities are. You tell people where your hope lies. Walk. What you say with your actions and reactions. Going and doing. Making choices. How you treat people. The living out of your life. What are you saying with your walk? Does your walk match your talk? When people are looking. When people aren't looking. When it doesn't seem to matter either way. Sometimes life squeezes you. When you lose your job. When you're sick. When the savings runs out. When the right thing and the easy thing aren't the same thing. When there is a lot to lose. The world sees us in those moments. Maybe your world includes. My parents. Your wife. Children. My co-workers. People who read my blog. Acts 16.25. Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. And the other prisoners were listening to them. Somebody is listening. Somebody is getting a picture of Christ. We communicate so much more when our words match our actions. Talk and walk. It's better together. In this current sermon series entitled Better Together, we are looking at what it means uh, to be the, the church, not only when we come together here in this place for corporate worship, uh, which in obedience to the scriptures is something we do, but then also when we leave and when we go out to the places where we live, where we work, and where we play. And uh, before we, we dig into the text this morning, I just want to tell you that at the conclusion of last Sunday's sermon, we talked about what it would look like to be the church and to pull our resources together so that we can ultimately meet, meet a physical need so that we can ultimately meet a spiritual need, which is taking or delivering uh, Jesus Christ to others. Jesus is the hope of the world, but God has established and raised up his church to be the vehicle to take Jesus uh, to our community and to our world. And so I want to uh, draw your attention to the insert that is in the bulletin this morning. Uh, perhaps you saw the signage when you pulled on the campus this morning. Uh, in response to that message and to looking at what it means to be the church, the hands and feet of Jesus in our, in our places where we live, work, and play, this congregation pulled resources together and donated over 30,000 pounds of food last Sunday afternoon. That food will be used to stock the Grace Works Food Pantry where people in Williamson County can have their physical need met, which there is great need in our community, as many of you are aware, so that ultimately through our ministry partners and even when we're there to participate in service and ministry, they can have their spiritual need met, and that's finding and discovering Jesus Christ. And on behalf of the staff, we, we put this in front of ourselves, and this is our model to live with an attitude of humility and service like Jesus did, and, and the generosity of this congregation is overwhelming time and time again, and I know God is going to use that to impact people and to change lives. And so I just want to express uh, gratitude on behalf of the staff to you this morning. Continuing with that thought, better together, pulling our resources, that we are not just the individuals of God, but that we see in the Bible that God calls out a people for himself. We are the people of God. And, you know, when you think about better together, uh, there are just some things, uh, we, we all know this to be true, uh, there are just some things that are good by themselves, but you put them with something else and they're great. Uh, let me give you an example. Um, I, I like to eat cookies but I like cookies and milk. Uh, by themselves, they're good. You put them together, they're, they're really good. Uh, there are other things. Um, man, I love Chick-fil-A nuggets, uh, but when I discovered Polynesian sauce, better, better together, just better together. It's not just food. Um, a lock on a door is really good, right? Okay, you got to have the key to get into that lock, so lock and key uh, works with that as well. Um, toilet is good. Toilet and paper is really good. <laughs> you, you know, I mean, we see this all around us. There's just things that you know, they're, they're good and they're important, but you put them together and they're pretty powerful. Uh, and this morning, what you saw in the, in the video leading up to our time uh, in the scriptures together today uh, is that our talk and our walk, equally important, are better together. Now our talk, which is important, are the, the things we say about God, the things we publicly profess, our, our prayer life, the things people hear about us. Here's some of the things people might hear from our talk, that we trust God, we believe God is in control, that we praise Him 
in the good and in the bad. That we trust him with every aspect of our life. That, that, that might sum up talk. Now here's walk. Walk is how we live out our faith. Uh, so it might be how we respond to the circumstances in our life when we get a diagnosis or when we lose our job or have to change employment or maybe it's how we behave in the backyard on the ball field or even in the parking lot what we say about the things of God is important what we live or walk about the things of God is equally important but you put those two things together, talk and walk, and together you have a pretty dynamic combination. You have a powerful combination, and I would suggest an even more effective combination for the purposes of God. And I want to show you in Scripture today, we're going to spend some time looking at Acts chapter 16. So if you have your Bibles with you this morning, I would encourage you to turn there. We're going to look at the story of two Christ followers, two men of God named Paul and Silas who realized that their talk was important and their walk was important, but it was certainly better together. So in honor of God's word, I want to invite you to stand with me this morning. And we'll begin reading in Acts 16, verse 25. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. And the other prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly there was such a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prison were shaken. At once all the prison doors flew open and everyone's chains came loose. The jailer woke up and when he saw the prison doors open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself because he thought that the prisoners had escaped. But Paul shouted, don't harm yourself, we're all here. The jailer called for the lights, rushed in and fell trembling before Paul and Silas. He then brought them out and asked, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? You, it says here, they replied, Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved, you and your household. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all the others in his house. At that hour of the night, the jailer took them and washed their wounds. And then immediately he and all his family were baptized. The jailer brought them into his house and set a meal before them. He was filled with joy because he had come to believe in God, he and his whole family. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening to them. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, we know that people are listening to us. We know they're listening to our talk, and they're watching our walk. We want to be the picture that you want them to see. We pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we step into our story. We step into the scriptures here where Paul and Silas have been arrested. This is during Paul's second missionary journey, and he and Silas are traveling into Europe, and they stop in a place called Philippi. We talked about this a little bit in last week's sermon. And we see that Paul and Silas in this chapter are preaching and teaching. Now, they were proclaiming the good news of Jesus Christ that we can't get to God to have a relationship with him unless we profess Jesus, believe on him to remove our sin, to remove our brokenness, to redeem us and reconcile us back to God. And as I mentioned last week, we might call this, we receive that message or we invite Jesus into our lives, or we respond to the gospel. And Paul and Silas were traveling around Philippi offering that message to people. But they didn't run into trouble, particularly in this town, until they were followed by a slave girl who had a spirit inside of her who could tell the future. Now, Paul and Silas certainly wanted the good news of Jesus to be told, but this slave girl who earned a profit for her owners by being able to do this, continue to follow Paul and Silas throughout the city and to continue to tell everyone these guys are servants of the Most High God and they're telling you the way to be saved. Paul became disturbed. He became frustrated. 
because of the noise and the confusion that this young slave girl who had the spirit inside of her was stirring up. And at one point he turns and he cast out the spirit inside of her in the name of Jesus Christ. Upon realizing that this slave girl no longer had the ability to tell the future, the slave owners are mad. Oh, they're angry at Paul and Silas. So they drag them and they take them to the leaders in the community, the magistrates. And they lead them before them in this crowd who witnessed this, which obviously would have been a sight. They see this and the entire crowd goes before the leaders of the community. And they start saying that these men here in Philippi, in this Roman colony, these men are Jews and they're creating an uproar. And not only that, they're teaching and preaching something that is unlawful for us to believe, to talk about, or to act upon. It's that mob mentality that at this point it was so raucous and so loud and the leaders looked and realized we're not going to be able to silence the crowd. So you know what? Let's just punish them. Let's just discipline them. Let's just put them in jail until we can figure out what we want to do. Only issue is Paul and Silas are Roman citizens. But they don't get a fair trial, which they should have. And so what happens is the leaders had them flogged, as the scripture tells us, had, it, had them beaten with wooden rods. And we're talking beaten badly, bruised, bloodied perhaps, and had them stripped naked. Now the only reason you do that publicly is to embarrass someone and to discourage anyone who's following them to flee so the same thing doesn't happen to you. So they had them beaten. They had them stripped naked. They embarrassed them in front of everyone and they told the jailer, put them in the jail and hold them securely. In other words, high profile prisoners do not let them get out. So the jailer takes them into the jail and you would have cells around the area and a special cell in the middle for high profile prisoners where he put Paul and Silas and even shackled their feet in stocks so that they couldn't get outside the jail door and they couldn't get outside of their own chains. And that's where we insert ourselves into the story with what we just read from the book of Acts. Now you would think that guys like that would be pretty mad. I mean, they, they've got a legitimate gripe here. They did not receive any kind of investigative work to aid in their defense. They didn't receive a fair trial and they were beaten, stripped naked and left in a cold, dark jail cell. You would assume that they would be bitter or that they would be angry, or that they would be frustrated for the way they were mistreated. But the scripture tells us that at midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. That what was coming out of them, their talk, was not frustration, was not anger, but that they were actually praying and singing out loud of their trust and their profession of faith in God, which was so counter to how most prisoners would have responded. And I'm certain that the other prisoners, including the jailer, must have thought, this is so counter to anyone who's been treated this way. Why in the world would these men behave in this manner? One of the things we're talking about in this series is that Jesus Christ is the foundation of the church. We are the vehicle. We are the lives that he uses to take himself, the good news of Jesus, to others. So therefore, Paul and Silas knew that the church is built on Jesus. Their lives are built on the foundation of Jesus. So what they do in these circumstances is that they remember if Jesus is their model, how did Jesus respond? What did he do? And the writer of Hebrews tells us that when Jesus was on his way to the cross and when he was beaten and when he was flogged himself and when he was persecuted and when he was made fun of because of the joy set before him because of the fact that he knew once this is done that I lay down my life in exchange for yours so that your sins can be forgiven so that you can be redeemed and reconciled and brought back to God once I do this my father will raise me up again and I will have victory over sin, over death, and over hell itself, and I will be seated at the right hand of my Father. And that joy allowed him to endure whatever circumstances he faced because he knew what was coming. And Paul and Silas, they didn't have a timetable. They weren't told how long they were going to be there. They weren't told whether they were going to have an advocate on their behalf, but they knew that God was their advocate. And they knew that Jesus had said, if you follow me, there will be a cost associated. You will be persecuted. You will be beaten. But here's the deal. It will not go for naught. The very circumstances that you find yourselves in that you probably don't want to be in is what I will use, and I will use you 
as my witnesses in that moment. And Paul and Silas find themselves in a position where rather than having their talk, their singing and their praying, rather than having that bitter and angry, they choose to trust God. And the only reason they're able to do that in their circumstances is because Jesus was dwelling inside of them. As the foundation of the church, if Jesus was able to not only trust God as well during his difficult circumstances, then they too, because Jesus is the source, is the foundation of the church and what we build our lives upon, then they too had Jesus dwelling inside of them and the ability to respond as he did. And so that's what they chose to do with their talk and the other prisoners were listening. It gave them a platform that they would not have otherwise had where they were able to push the focus of everything going on in that prison up towards God. And it is at that moment that God uses a supernatural miracle. He causes an earthquake to happen. Now, earthquakes in Philippi in that area of Europe are not unusual. But here's the deal about earthquakes. As you and I both know of what we see, not only in our country, but around the world, and especially in a day and age where you don't have building codes like Philippi, Earthquakes destroy buildings. They level city blocks. And while everyone is listening and focused on the talk and who they're talking to, this earthquake happens and everything shakes and everyone's attention is arrested. And everyone is looking at what's going to take place, but the buildings don't fall. They don't crumble. They're not dead. What happens is the jail doors fly open and the shackles fall off of their hands. And there's nothing standing between the prisoners, including Paul and Silas, and their freedom. There's nothing. I mean, it had to be one of the most perplexing things ever. We just experienced an earthquake, but nothing crashed. But all the jail cells are open. And all the chains have been loosed. And there's this picture I get in my head of Paul and Silas and the other prisoners realizing there's nothing between me and my freedom. And you would assume they would bolt, they would go, they would run because I, I got to do what's in my own best interest. I got to do what's, what's for my own health and well-being. And so instead of doing that, in this moment, the Philippian jailer realizes the jail cells are open and he's probably confused. I don't know why things didn't collapse and crush and why we're still alive, but the cells are open and they're gone. And in this day and age, if you failed at the task that was given to you, especially as a jailer and the prisoners escaped, you paid for it with your own life and you were executed. So what's the jailer thinking? This is it. I don't know what just happened, but it's over for me. And he's about to take his own life. When Paul yells out, don't do it. Don't harm yourself. We're all here. Now he could have run. They could have run and they could have left. They could have done what was in their own best interest, but they knew as the church, Paul and Silas were members of the body of Christ, which is called the church, and as members of the church with Jesus as the foundation of the church, living and working in and through them, they knew that Jesus himself had said, I have not come to be served, but to serve. And Paul would later write to the Philippians, Jesus gave up his place in heaven to come and to die for you and to serve you. And if you've been moved by that at all, this is what we talked about last week. If you have been impacted by the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, then do like Jesus did, who 2,000 years ago, while he was on the cross, losing his life so that we could have ours is giving us life, is giving life to the thief on the cross next to him. He's not thinking of his own interest. He's thinking of others first. If you've been moved by that, that's the model. That's the foundation of the church. Those of us who call ourselves Christians, Christ followers, that's our model. That's who we are. That's what we do. And Paul and Silas, knowing that they could run and leave the jail cell, realized the way of Jesus is to think about, why am I here? And how can I use this as witness? And what is it that God's calling me to do that is in the best interest of others instead of myself? And so Paul and Silas take a flyer on bolting from the jail and they turn around to this jailer and they say, don't harm yourself, we're here. Nobody's gone. Well, the jailer comes in and he realizes, I, I, he's probably confused. Wait a minute, like you, I heard you singing and praying. I heard your talk, but, but you didn't leave. 
Like, why didn't you leave? And he comes rushing in, and he falls down on his knees, and it says he fell down trembling. And he calls for the lights, and he says to them, look at what the scripture says. He calls out, in verse 29, for the lights. He rushed in and fell trembling before Paul and Silas. He then brought them out and asked, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? What do I got to do? I don't understand everything that's happening, but I just saw a miracle, and you are worshiping God. And so something is taking place here, and God used the miracle of the earthquake and Paul and Silas staying to open up the jailer's heart to receive the good news of Jesus. And he says, how must I be saved? Like, how do I get out of this whole circumstance, this whole situation? And how do I have what you have? How do I get that? I've been spared from the earthquake. I've been spared from taking my own life. And now I want to be spared from my separation from God. How can I be saved? And because Paul and Silas in their talk knew that they build their talk on the person of Jesus Christ, and they knew that they stayed and thought of his interest more important than their own because that's what Jesus would do, because they knew their talk and their walk were influenced and supported and built upon the life of Jesus, why else would they give the guy anything else other than Jesus in this moment? And so when he says, what must I do to be saved? They say this. They look at him and say, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. You and your household. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all others in his house. And this man became a believer in God. He moved from spiritually being dead to spiritually being alive, being saved, brought into a relationship with God through his belief in the person of Jesus Christ as Savior and as Lord. And you read this story and you think, what if they had run? What if they had bolted? Because sometimes we find ourselves in the places where we live, work, and play. If we're honest with ourselves, we find ourselves wanting to head out. I want to be used by God, but it is much easier to just move on rather than look around to the interest of others around us. What if they had left and gone back to the Philippian church and said, whew, man, that, whew, that was close. Pray, that, pray and ask God to let nothing bad like that ever happen again. What if they had done that? Well, based on what we know about the culture, the Philippian jailer would have been executed. He'd have never heard the gospel, and he would have spent eternity separated from Christ. But they stayed. Because in humility and service, what we talked about last week, they wanted to look to his needs more than their own. And God opened up this man's heart, God's Holy Spirit, and used Paul and Silas as his vehicle to give him the gospel. The church, the people of God, Paul and Silas, were used to deliver Jesus to this man. And his life was changed forever. Not only his life, but the household. The gospel not only impacted this man, but then it impacted his household. Now, now that could be his wife and his children, but in that day and age, many family members lived in the same house. It could have been in-laws, it could have been relatives, it could have been people that they had invited in to take care of. Y you see, when we, this is not just Paul and Silas's story, because for those of us who profess Christ in 2011, this is our story. This is who we are as the church. This is what we do as the church. And so when they were used by God and when we allow ourselves to be used by God, our talk and our walk together as a powerful, effective combination for the glory of God and for saving other people. God used this to change this man's life, his household, the relationships around him. It impacted his city. When Paul and Silas left the city, there were Christians there to worship and serve and minister to others. And if you play this movie forward far enough, we're standing here in North America, those of us who profess Christ and who gather together to worship God and proclaim his name, because Jesus started everything and reached 11 men who were sold out to him. And ultimately, the gospel message spread through people like Paul and Silas to places like Philippi. And God still uses the church, his people in community to impact lives one life at a time, 
one household at a time, one city at a time. It still happens today. And when you read and understand and look through the book of Acts at how God has organized and deployed us, sent us out as the church, he still desires to take Jesus to other people through our lives. Now, when you read this, I want to be like Paul and Silas. Now, I think about, listen, I think about, like, what would have happened if they hadn't stayed? Well, the jailer never comes to Christ. Maybe his family never does. It has eternal ramifications. But we're here today reading this story because they stayed. No doubt how many hundreds of thousands of people throughout time and history have believed in Jesus because they heard this story and they wanted the same thing the jailer did. Sa how, how do I get saved from my relationships? How do I get saved from my brokenness? How do I get saved? I'm trying to do all the right things and I still, <laughs> I just want to get off this merry-go-round in life. How can I be saved from all of this? And no telling how many people have stumbled upon this story or heard it proclaimed and said, I want what that jailer got. And what that jailer got was Jesus. I want to wake up and be used like Paul and Silas. And, and I pray and I hope that you will join our staff in praying that God would raise up our church to be a church like this where our talk and our walk, yes, when we gather together corporately, in the parking lot, in the hallways, in here in the worship center, but when we scatter, where we live, where we work, and where we play, we'll be used by God to take people Jesus. I want to be like that. I want to be used like that. I, I do, and I, and, and, I, and I ask you to join our staff in praying that we would be used like that. But I know that even well-intended I don't just wake up and act like that. Now, you and I both know that. We can be, we can be used by God, and sometimes we, 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 we start out good, but we kind of just go downhill. Because this is the nature of life. And though we know Christ, we live in a world that does not support and point us and others towards Jesus. And plus, it's just, it's just hard sometimes following Jesus. But Paul and Silas not only had a relationship with Jesus, they had a relationship with each other, and they had a relationship with the church, with other Christians. They were not only the individuals of God, but they were the people of God. Because they realized we, we really are better together. Pull our resources, pull our efforts, pull our energy, our talk and our walk is better together. Let's do this. And I would just like to submit to you that we too are better together when we join one another in Christian community. Hear me say this. I said this last week and I'll say it again. Yes, God can use you and save people in and through your life and your talk and your walk where you live, where you work, and where you play as an individual. Absolutely. But when we come together and walk through life, did you notice that when the Philippian jailer got saved, when he became a Christ follower, do you notice how he started living and behaving? He started serving and washing their wounds just like Jesus had washed and served the disciples' wounds. There was a changed heart. There was a transformed life. And while we want to be like this and God gives us this picture to say, this is what I'm calling you to do as a congregation, we have often noticed that this transformation, this changed life of not only knowing Jesus, but following Jesus, this changed and transformed life, happens best, oftentimes, in community with other Christ followers, where we study the Word together, we pray together, we sing together, lift each other's burdens, we mourn together. We do all of the things that the church does corporately and together when we're sent out. And so this is still the vision for God's church, for us to be used by Him as instruments. He's the one who changes lives, but He uses our gifts, our talents, our talk, and our walk. He does still today. And if you are not connected to a body of believers, if you've been attending this church and you have not connected to the membership to say, I, I want to be connected to others who are trying to do this with God as our source, as our strength, as our hope, I want that. If you have not come together with the body of believers, I would encourage you to do that today. Because that is God's desire for us not only to know Jesus, but then to know him and follow him with others in community. It's scriptural. So in the very least, before you leave today, the, the discipleship ministry of this church 
prays through, thinks through, studies through, how do we put church members, the professing Christians who gather together for worship corporately, and then when we scatter, how do we put you in a position to walk with God in community with others through life? There are numerous opportunities for you to do that today. And here's the deal, we're not all the same. The church staff understands that. God does not call us all to grow in the same way. He just calls us all to move in the same direction, which is towards Christ-likeness, to be conformed into the image of Jesus. If nothing else, when you leave today, stop by the atrium and talk to somebody on the discipleship staff about getting connected to other people, about doing life with them, because we really are better together. But if you've never experienced what the Philippian jailer did, it can change your life. The name of Jesus, there's enough power in the name of Jesus to change your life, to change your household, to change your workplace, to change your community, to change the world. The name of Jesus. If you've never experienced what the Philippian jailer did, I would encourage you to give your life to Christ today and tell him, I want what he had. I want Jesus. I not only want to be saved from my current condition and circumstances, but I want eternal life. I want my sin to be washed away. I want it to be made whole, and I want to be reconciled to the God of the universe through a relationship with Jesus. If nothing else, do that today, and come join us as we are the hands and feet of God, the body of Christ, simply offering our lives, our talk, and our walk to Jesus so that he can use it to change our world. We are better together, and the thing that makes us better together is the name of Jesus.